Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and joining me, the warden of Nassau County, supreme leader of all spoilers. As it turns out, we were spoiled. I was going to say with every episode, I'm sure you're wishing more and more that you were spoiled. But technically, we have been spoiled for these last two episodes, at least the highlights of them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are you less disappointed because you were spoiled? I mean, we weren't sure. We weren't positive that these were these last minute leaks were legit. You know, I'm going to try to say this honestly. Maybe with the exception of the very first leak that occurred soon after Season 7 ended, all the other leaks would have been more gratifying. How, do you, how, do you, how does this happen, John? What happened here? How do we get to this point? And honestly, it's, I, I think after Episode 3, it's just been like watching a train come at you in slow motion. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well the, well, the first thing I, want, I really want to make, I want to say this before we get on to the, to the real mashed potatoes and gravy section of our uh, podcast, I do want to make sure that this has definitely been said to all you morons out there who named your daughter Khaleesi <laughs> or Daenerys, Danny. Right. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. You just need your daughter after a freaking genocidal mass murderer. Name name your next uh, name your son Hitler next. Yeah, yeah. Adolf. Yeah, but carry on. I, I just want to make sure I got that in. It seems like season eight has been the Arya season. I don't think there's yeah. been much well, it, development yeah. or much storyline for any other character. To be honest, yeah, really, really, it's been Arya and and uh, Danny. That's it. Uh, Jamie too for the first couple episodes, and then yeah. You but know. you know, I, I just said to you before we we started, you know, I think it's amazing how much money I think they've paid Lena Heedy and Kit Harrington this season. Yeah. They're really doing one. I mean, Lena Heedy is basically been staring out a window, mm-hmm. and Kit Harrington has basically been saying like three lines with a little bit of action. You know, th- he, three lines, a little bit of action, and the third thing coming about the truth about his parents and which, which whether was- receiving. Or giving the information. Which was good acting. And like I said, I thought his his little speech at the beginning of episode four, I, I thought that was some good acting also. But for right. the most part. I mean, he's always had more to do than Cersei. But still, you, you just – you would think after all the reveals with him past season six and seven, this mm-hmm. is going to be a huge, you know. Mm-hmm. And he's just kind of been like a subplot at this point. Like, she is my queen. You know who's gotten a, a pretty large chunk of storyline this season? Your boy Grey Worm. Oh, God. I hope John kills him next week. Well. I hope he does. He's been acting like such a punk. Yeah, I, I don't. I, all right. Well, let's, let's, let's take a look at, at this episode first. And, mm-hmm. um, yep. Miguel Sapochnik, who I think has been – he's been their all-star director – for the last few years, going back to season six. Yeah. I'm gonna, uh, oh, season so five, I'm, actually. I want to cut you off right now just sure. one second. I want to make, I, I know where you're, where you're going to be leading this whole entire podcast and myself, and it's going to be kind of very negative. But I just, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I want, I want to say this. <coughs> you mentioned Miguel Sapochnik, and outside of the fact that we couldn't see anything happening in episode three, um, our negative is not, negativeness is not, Towards the directors, the cameramen, the cinematography, the special effects, and especially act- not towards the- especially not towards the music, the music, Raman Jabadi, or the actors. I think there's been a lot of good performances this year. Yes, and this is by far probably been uh, Emily Clark's best performance. She's been outstanding. 
and especially I considering what everybody's had to work with i think yeah. the entire cast has been out, outstanding but, but it just all comes back to the end day it's and we'll the get on yeah it will we'll get on with it and and i i just wanted to say that you know we're not tr- we're not bashing the the effort by the staff members and the actors and actresses of the show i think they've done a very good job considering what they've been dealt with. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, I, I I think they've all wanted better. I think you know. I think they've all wanted to do more. I think they all really wanted to really go out with the bang. Have you they, have you watched any of the interviews that people are alluding to? Disappointing. Kit Harrington said it disappointing. Emily what? Clark was like laughing, like "Huh, oh, best best season ever." Huh, oh, like you know, like mocking it. Yeah. Like, I think they know, like, this isn't, you know, fans don't want to see this. I mean, how is this, it's, I mean, is it, you know, I, I know George has said it's a bittersweet ending. I only think this is bittersweet. Okay, well, I, I do want to start with Miguel Sapashnik, but let's let's address this because, I mean. I'm sorry, I, I, I curse. No, 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 it's, it's, to, I mean, all, all I was going to do is, you know, I, I want, just wanted to compare you know, the, the, the directing of this episode to. The long night, and mm-hmm. I, I thought they were, they're both mammoth episodes, uh, large scale, and I think he did an outstanding job with both. Uh, I didn't have as much a problem with the darkness, uh, the literal darkness of episode <laughs> three as a, a lot of other people, but um, I understand that complaint. But still, you know, the two episodes, it wasn't a directing thing; it, it was a writing thing. Um, you know, I mean, Miguel Sapachnik is not blocking the battle, per se, right? He's not coming up with the darkness. The, well, the darkness, but the like the poor decision-making on oh, both no, no, sides, they, on both you know, armies. They, 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 that, they wrote that. They right. they wrote, you know, I'm sure they, you know, and we're, we're going to get on within a couple minutes after yeah. we, you know, we talked about, we talked about the good things. But there's there's got to be a lot, a, a lot, to, a lot, a lot to be said. Um, you know, last season, season seven, I think uh, this is where I said I was wrong a few weeks ago, and I'll, I'll say I was wrong again. Um, they could not do this in the time they wanted to. It just, it's its evident. What, what, what do you mean? Benny and Weiss they don't Offenweiss, have enough episodes? They did, no, they, 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 they needed more time to do this. Well, they were naive to think that they could do this in... Third, I mean, after season six, they, that's when you know. After season six, they just wanted to do seven more episodes. That was it, or maybe ten more episodes. That was it. But the the HBO the said that they just said, you know, there's no way. There's well, no way HBO do H- that. HBO's on record having offered to them do more episodes this year to do ten episodes this season and last season. I'm sure too. I'm sure they'd want a ninth season. You know, I mean, this episode had twelve point four, twelve point five million viewers um and that's after last week's episode which i think was worse than this episode i i I think last week's episode i think the last of the starks may may have been the worst episode of game of thrones period i think you know i i have to wait for it to settle some more i guess but so the bells if you look at it just as a single episode it's not that bad it's not great, but it's not that bad. But when you look at it at the bigger picture, season eight, it's the character arcs, what what happens, the rushing of storylines, it's really bad. We talked about during season seven, the, the, the entire, are Arya and Sansa, are they enemies now? The Littlefinger subplot during season seven. Mm-hmm. I mean, that had so much more development than anything that went on in season eight. Am I wrong? Like the amount of time spent with Sansa and Littlefinger and Arya and the back and forth for it to ultimately be a ruse to catch Littlefinger. You'll compare that with Danny's arc this season or with Jamie's arc this season. So it's not so much a problem I have with where the characters end up. My big problem is how Mm -hmm. illogically they got there. Even Jamie and Cersei, you know, if you told me that that's that's their ultimate fate, 
right? Uh, uh, getting crushed by a tower. Bunch of bricks. Right. If you told me that's their fate, okay, Jamie is, is rushing to get to her, by, you know, to get by her side. You know, there's a way that that result can work, but it's not the way Benioff and Weiss have done it. I mean, pretty much that's the case with everything. Even Daenerys, which you know, I know we'll get to later. Like yeah, a lot of people have telegraphed what happens with Daenerys, but there's too much of a leap there. Like the hints are there and the motive is there, but the leap that she makes, her character makes, is so extreme. And it feels like it feels like they did a lot of padding in episode seven. And uh, I'm sorry, in season seven. Right. And because of that, season eight has suffered greatly. So I, I don't know. But what, what, do you, what, what positives do you have from, uh, from this, this episode? episode? Yeah. Well, I, I like the initial battle sequence. I always, I've always liked. I mean, in, even in episode three, I've, I like the pre-fight setup. Yeah, you know, people getting into this, you know, into their, um, into their spots, you know, march, you know, getting it, you know, all aligned. The tension, like that right? I, I've always liked that about anything. I think it goes back to when I was a kid. I used to always have my. My, my toys that have good guys versus bad guys, and I always would always line them up, like just like how you see, you know. Yeah. So I always, I've always liked that, and I and I like that about see, you know, episode three. So I like that. I like. I like varies. I like varies. Right. The one thing I like about the varies thing was, just having when he was executed, was having John there. I thought was just. I don't know. Mm, like, yes. felt, yeah, he felt out a place to be there because, like, it's because of it, basically, you know, in a roundabout way, it's because of him that he's, you know, like. Well, no, it was, like, I don't know. It, it was Tyrion that, um, that told right, the but you know, but you know, dinner. He says, "Well, yeah, well." He, oh, yeah, Tyrion, because you because learned of who from John Sansa is. and Sancha and John and yeah. Sansa and John betrayed me by telling Sansa, yeah. which you know, again, though, like John didn't betray Danny. He said he was going to tell Sansa. Like he didn't lie to her. Yeah, he says I'm going to tell Sansa and Arya. Like, I'm going to tell them this. He didn't betray her at all. Uh, to, uh, I'm going to get taunt. I'm going to get out to Danny so much. This this is going to be an all nighter. Did you catch that Varys is trying to poison Danny? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I I caught that from the get go. That you know we'll try again. You know you knew Varys was had made his decision last week, mm-hmm. um, and it was the right decision. No, oh, he would have saved thousands of lives. Yeah, and he knew it. He 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 saw it coming. I don't I don't know. Do you want to even get to? Is this what will happen to Varys in A Song of Ice and Fire? I just don't. I don't know because it's, yeah, I don't because think so. with with Varys is you're leaving that in the book. You know, A Song of Ice and Fire, you're, you're leaving out Fagin's storyline. So you know that there's such a hard leap to find out how he gets from point A to point B in there because of that. Well, I do think, and you've been saying it for a couple of years now that Cersei has gotten a lot of the Fagin storyline. And I do think that's the case. Um, I do feel like this battle at King's Landing is something that's going to take place between Daenerys and young Griff posing as Aegon Targaryen. And that would make a bit more sense as far as the Daenerys. It, it would make that a little more bittersweet if you know, it's Targaryen versus Targaryen, and they're destroying. Even though one's not really a Targaryen, but honestly, I, I can't even, I can't even like picture how. You know, it, if this is I, the, I was the fate thinking, of George's characters, how that fits into his story, right? And I was thinking, just talk about Cersei. The fact that they killed her off in such a way makes me almost think even more to that Fagin's involved with Danny in, 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 in a conflict because. They know that this is so separate how she dies in the books that we, we don't know what to do with her. We can't, we can't come up with anything, a good way of killing her because we, we're, we're, 
we're we're hack writers and we can't come up with anything good, but we'll just have her be killed by a bunch of bricks. Mm-hmm. But it's not just the bricks. It's it's just everything. And, and she she always thinks she's more clever than she actually is, Cersei. Right. No wildfire was being burned. But we saw wild. Um, I guess those were just caches of wildfire. Yeah, there was. Yeah. For a second, I thought there were like, oh my god, now, now you're really going to see this place explode. Yeah. Nope. But it just never happened. Like you know, there was no like. It was just so every you know. It's mud. Everything's so mess. far about this season. There's one word I can think of, or maybe two words: anticlimactic. Okay. You know, Quiburn's there saying, "Oh, all our scorpions are dead, are gone." Like, really? Like, you don't have that. <laughs> and even in any bad movie, you you know where it's good versus bad, or whatever you want to call it. There's always that one. We still have one left. You know, there's always that one left. They, they had no plan B. Yeah. What was there? Was with no that? Pro- there was no protection at the uh, at the throne room area, you know, at the Tower of the Hand. There was no protection. There was no scorpions there. There was there was no like, you know, air arsenal there. Like, you knew you know that she's going to come with the Drake. And there's no, I don't know. It just and it's illogical because all right, fine, fine. If 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 that's what you're going to sell us, okay. But last week you sold us that you had three friggin' Critical hits on on Regal from and like you. There was a funny meme. There was a funny meme on that. It was like, um, oh god, I forgot what it was. Like, how come like when you shoot Regal, it's like you have like the uh, the the uh, the shooting the the uh, actually of like I forgot what it was like Legolas or something. Right. But when you're shooting down Drogon, also you're a bunch of stormtroopers. Yeah. Right. The plot armor this season is out of control. And, it, you know, this all goes back to The Long Night. And what we both said was no A characters were killed. I mean, you want to call Jorah Mormon an A character, that's fine. but That's as close as you get to an A character, I right. think, who got killed. The, the guys that you – like, you knew – the characters that died were characters you knew were going to die. And that's all that died. So there's no, there's no drama going into this battle. Like they had all that plot armor, and then you just wipe the rest out in this battle. It's it, it's like they're mm-hmm. trying to keep around the main characters as long as possible. You know what I mean? It, it, it's just for the sake to keep them around, right. and then we're just going to kill them in such emotionless. Like, there's just no emotion. There was no emotion when Cersei died. No emotion to me when Jamie died. Nope. I didn't feel that, like, oh my god. Gosh, man, you know what? Eight seasons of this character, he died. Wow, I can't believe it. The only feeling... It was, I, it was I, just like, eh. The only feeling I have about it is that oh, that's it? Like, that's... That's how they go out? It's not, I'm not sad, you know? I'm not... I haven't been thinking about it for days. And to be honest with you, as I was watching the episode, I was pretty bored. It wasn't exciting. No. It felt just like the end of the long night. It just wasn't exciting. It wasn't. Maybe that's because we, we saw the leaks and we kind of knew what was going to happen. And it'd be like, oh, yeah, those those leaks are true. I don't know. I don't know. There's so many little things. When you go back to the Scorpions from the you know Euron's Inter- 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 fleet, and we talk about you know them nailing you know three shots and then missing you know, but part of the reason why you know you made Euron know, to be like this you know great you know <laughs> prime accurate Scorpion shooter, yeah. But when Drogon comes, he's not shooting. Right, he's got the new guy like, shooting. Yeah, like <laughs> I, I trust you, bud. It's <laughs> like. <laughs> Just like I showed you, you know, like it, it just makes no sense. A lot of things don't make sense. Yeah, well, they, they pigeon themselves. You know, the problem with that is they probably pigeons. They probably even thought about it. Like how we they pigeon 
themselves into this corner. We may, you know, you don't have to be this such accurate shooter. No one's gonna, bu- no one's gonna buy it if he's gonna, you know, start missing like three, four in a row right. on one dragon. So like, oh, we're gonna have to get the this new cat we brought in. His name of uh, Ted Rivers, you know, to, uh, to do the shoot, to do the killing here. Right, and then you may as well have had a scene. You're on saying. All right, it's it's your time to shine. You know, this is, this is your moment. <laughs> Just like I showed you. <laughs> yeah. Nice and easy. <laughs> Cork your arm back. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm disappointed that of of the many, many things I'm disappointed in, I am, you know, I'll be the first to say it from the end of, well, from the beginning of season seven, really, I, I thought Euron would be a much more dangerous well, yeah, character. And, you know, like we thought of that. He was a henchman. Yeah, yeah. We, we thought about it in season six. I thought we thought he would, oh, this guy's a clown. Yeah. And, and I thought, I think it's fair to say, and I don't want to speak for you, but I, I thought we thought we liked some things of season seven. I think we, you know, we, we knew we were going to get your on from the book you're on. We knew that we, we knew that going and we were not going to get, you know, book right. you're on here. Right. But we, we, we thought I, there was some definitely at least some sort of potential that would get something out of him that would be different, that would be kind of like a Euron, but not the full. But then season eight, he's just, as you said, he's just like this henchman. He's a henchman. You know, with the smiling and, you know, this, I, I don't know. It just, I, I killed, don't know. I killed Jamie Lannister. You didn't, kill, uh, but you didn't kill you Jamie didn't, Lannister. But you didn't kill him. He still was living. I mean, yeah, maybe he would have died if the bricks didn't land on him. I might eventually die, but you didn't kill him. The bricks killed him. Yeah. And, uh, and like in that scene, it just, I I just I I just can't see that scene happening in the books. No, Jamie versus Euron, dude. It's not. I really don't buy it. It won't happen in the books because those things don't happen in real life. And George is trying to write. Granted, it's a fantasy story. He's trying to make it as realistic as possible. So it goes back to, you know, our argument that in no reality would Stannis ever, ever, ever be the first one over the wall, right? So, and in no reality would <laughs> Harry Strickland be at the front of his army. In no reality is Jamie and Euron going to cross paths there. They're just, they're just jumping just all over seems, the place with things. Right, it just seems so convenient. Like, uh, Kingslayer, I'm just like, ah. Oh. God, I was really just hoping that wasn't going to happen, and I it just—I don't know. It, it did. I don't know. It, it, it didn't really do anything for me. I, I thought it was filler. I thought it was just something that hey, look, we can have these two guys go at it. Now we need to kill Euron, so we'll have Jamie have the Euron kill. It, you know, it's almost like that's what they're doing. Like we, we can't have. You know, we're not going to have too many people with. Two like two kills, like Arya's got the Night King, which we made up. Uh, we'll have Jamie kill you know Euron. Rix will kill Jamie and Cersei. Um, you know each one's gonna get a kill. Each character will get one kill. That's it. Right, like like no, they ca- think they're giving each character like a moment. Right, exactly. Yeah. Look, Jamie's moment for this season was when he showed up at Winterfell. Right, you know, and, and, and like that, two episodes later, he destroyed the moment. And and I, and I will say, I, I still think episode two of this season was one of the best written episodes of the series, and it's it's just all been downhill from there. Uh, but episode two was Jamie's moment, and uh, you know, the plot armor of episode three just really it took away the stakes in this whole thing. I. Never took Cersei as. I mean, I, I don't know if you you do consider her like the last challenge before the series is ending because I guess Daenerys is now. Um, I will say a, a positive, and it's a positive, honestly, about this whole season, and I actually do rather like it because this character has really been on the bench for the last two seasons, I think. And that's Tyrion. I think Tinklage is I think Tinklage is gonna get that that last <laughs> Emmy nomination. <laughs> this time I really mean it. 
But uh, yeah, how how wrong was that leak? Tyrion, Tyrion standing trial. Yeah, it doesn't look like that's happening. No, that, see that, yeah, that the guy, the, the Spanish dude, right? You're talking about with the fiend. Yeah, I don't think that's happening. No, it's it's not. And if it if it is, it's not because he betrayed anybody. I think what I liked least about this episode is the damage done to Jon Snow by proximity. What are your thoughts on Jon Snow this episode? It's just like what they basically been doing to him all season. It's just like a side character right now. It's like a sideshow. Mm-hmm. I didn't like how the North attacked and went against Jon's orders holding back. Like how you know they you know they said like oh we wanted to make you know we wanted to flip the coin and make the good guys actually look at like the bad guys killing the you know the innocent you know bad guys throwing the swords down. I didn't like how the North went you know you know the went in and just went, went with a bloodshed. You know, John just goes around and just says, she is my queen. And she is my queen. The North will support you. The North will support Queen Daenerys. Watching John in that battle, really from the get-go with this episode, with, with uh, Drogon executing Varys, you know, my first problem is whatever happened to he who passes the sentence should swing, should swing the sword. I guess that's technically what happens. Daenerys passes the sentence. You know, John's not a headsman, so she she kills him with uh, Drogon. Um, but do you think John looked conflicted in that moment? You think Kit Harrington acted this episode as best he could? I, I just I feel I don't feel good about uh, his character uh, right now. Just I have to watch that scene again. I really haven't I watched it more than once. When very we talk about various it's actually I haven't watched. I just watched it once. Yeah. And as I said before, I I think he just was out of place being there. I don't I I don't know why he was there. I think all they had to do was have a scene with him and Tyrion and say Tyrion like you know having Tyrion say listen yeah she uh, had had, had various like, we had ex, you know various executed for treason. Because I know who you, because you know he knew who you are. I don't think if he just sound, it just looked out of place for him to be there. Like he should not have been involved in that, you know, of that death. Like, like, oh look, I'm just going to stand here. All right, what are some other positives from this episode? Did you like Clegane Bowl? I feel like I would have liked it more if it was in any other episode. But by the time we got to it, I was just bored. And I'm like, all right, well, I guess this is happening now. <laughs> <laughs> like even Sanders' death. It's just like, all right, well, whatever. You know, may as well kill everybody now. Uh, well, they've proven, I think, over the over the eight years that they just – I mean, I think they the Brienne-Sandor fight. Was their best one on one sword fight they've had? Oh, absolutely. They're not. They're not big into one on one sword fights at all. They just don't. They just don't do it. Really. I mean, because even in this one, I mean, after a while, they you know, Santa Lou, you know, puts a puts a sword through his belly. Doesn't affect them at all. You know. <laughs> yeah. Didn't see that one coming. And how about and then, how about you know, Quiburn's fate? Like that was just like what. Kind of funny, but it's just like yeah, but I, I don't know. just suck. I bet you're a queen. Oh, I don't have my plot armor on. Uh oh. Yeah. When um, I laughed because uh, my my first sword when uh, when Sandra gets that shot on him against like towards his head and the mask comes off, <laughs> he kind of like varies. Yeah. Right. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's very he's he's back. It would have been sick if it was Mark Addy, actually. Not, yeah, you, dude, I said was that hoping before. I was, that was like, hoping, no way, but yeah, I was hoping for that. Oh my god, I was hoping for that. Like that would have been. Oh, dude, there's so many things that like they could have easily could have done that made this whole entire season so 
spectacular and maybe fan service over the top fan service, but still, like it, it, it would have been better than this. Are they? I don't. I don't feel like they're even doing any fan service. I'm not sure what they're what they were thinking with this. I mean, look, I'm trying to think about what other projects they have going on, and and they haven't done anything. They don't have anything except. <laughs> The next Star Wars trilogy, yeah, which oh, I, I don't know, bro. Honestly, Brian Johnson's looking—he's looking like a million bucks right now. He keeps on freaking, he keeps on uh, trolling them too. Yeah, yeah. Well, because they—he was supposed this trilogy was supposed to be his, and Disney decided to go with Penny and Weiss. I think a little bit prematurely. Yeah, they <coughs> should have gone with someone else. I think we talked about this in one of our episodes this season. And it had to be for three or four. I would think for four, but the seasons one through four, while they have their problems, they're really engaging because they're adapting material. Season five, where they start to deviate, it's still engaging because we're invested in these characters. And season six was amazing because it was it wasn't based on entirely on written material, but it was logical conclusions to a lot of storylines um, that George may or may not do, but, and correct me if I'm wrong, but season six did not have much with the White Walkers. It's just been well, the, the Hodor, right? The Hodor scene was their main focus, and like the, and the episode after that. Yeah. But once we get to season seven, it's like so many problems, you know. And we let a lot slide with season seven, and and here we have rushed storylines, lack of canon, lack of logic, and them rushing to get to certain spots. Jamie Lannister, he literally went, it, it's it's like the equivalent of going from like Chile to Canada back to Chile. And he did that, you know, from the last episode of, of season seven to the end of episode one. And then somehow he raced down again, you know, and that's always been a problem, the traveling, traveling time, how easy it was to cover these distances Taking that for granted, and I'm talking about Benioff and Weiss taking it for granted, it just shows a, like a tremendous lack of detail in their storytelling. They, they, they showed like, like if they knew these these were the fates of these characters and the ultimate ending for this story, if they knew that from however many years out they should have planned for that from however many years out and i don't mm-hmm. think that they did no it's uh, it's really almost as if they mailed it in this past season yeah. they, i mean it just and it's not like they had to rush it they had plenty they of had time two to do seasons. they had like i don't know it just seems like everything that they've come up with it just seems like Whatever we do, we're going to do to this, you know, like, it's like when you try and study for a test and you had all week to study to a te- to, for a test, but you're not going to study until the night before and during, you know, during the day at school, last minute cramming. Yeah. That's what they're doing. That's right. what they seem to be doing. Right. Right. And I think, that, and I think that's a major problem, I think, with what we're, when we talk about Danny I think that's a major problem because they they had chances over the years to remind us of her psychoness, and they kind of tried to bury it because they didn't want to show her in a bad light. Do you think that they were they were trying? I, I can't even argue that. Like they were trying to do like a surprise. Like it'd be yeah. Well, they want they wanted the sh- they wanted the shock moment. That's what that's a, you know anything for a shock moment. Would you have been shocked if you didn't know the spoilers? No, not really. 
Um, only, you know, it, it's funny, you know, you, you were really piping down that she was going to be a villain and, uh, that guy, John Targaryen that you met, you know, he was, he was hell bent from what you were saying that she's the villain. She's the ultimate she's, villain. Yeah. She, yeah. She's the villain. And, you know, I just, you know, and I think part of the argument that we're just talking about right now is one thing I, we, we were telling you this at the time. I was just like, I don't know if I buy it because I think mainly because I didn't think they would have enough time to do that. Well, they did, but I, they, but they didn't. Like they could have, but they didn't have enough time to do it. Not, not for this season, you know. Right. Like I didn't think they had enough time to sh- to really fully show that. And I think that's part of the problem. So when it happened, I wasn't surprised. Like, yeah. Uh, here's the, the ultimate. Here's the thing, dude. Oh. You know what? Here's the thing with Game of Thrones. It would be. It would have been a much better ending if they had just treated. The White Walkers, the way they treated John Connington and Fa- and and Fagon, like if they just figured out a way to not include the White Walkers at all, the show would have been a lot better. And that's not saying that the idea of the White Walkers, the others, that that's a bad idea. I think that's probably the most important part of the Song of Ice and Fire, but. They didn't embrace it. They didn't know how to write it. They didn't. It, it was it was a burden for them. Like, all right, everybody's got to get north to fight them real quick, and then we got to get everybody back south to deal with Cersei. Right. I mean, the way they handled the, the the long night, it was like the short night. It was like one night. Yeah, like you know, when I thought about this big battle in my head, I mean, I. I was thinking that this battle would take like months. I was thinking, yeah, I would think. I was and thinking then they, they would come would, down they, they, further south, further south, further south, till finally, right? You know, the alliance would come with. There, there would be some sort of a solution via Bran, somehow, some way that they, you know, that they how to defeat the Night King. Instead, it's just this little, you know, dagger flip. Oh, hold on, got it in that hand. Got him. That does the trick. Nice job. Let's go get Cersei. Who is who seems like she's super ready for <laughs> the attack on King's Landing in, in episode four, but then the actual attack on King's Landing, it's like, oh, uh, oops. Like Cersei was better at handling the Tyrells than she was at handling the Targaryens, and she had a lot more time to handle the Targaryens. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking like they would lose Winterfell and go south and White Walkers would follow and then the White Walkers would attack King's Landing and Cersei would be forced then at that point to to help them and that's how they finally defeat them and then maybe Daenerys, you know, can then it would be more of a shock if Daenerys then starts, you know, burning everybody that helped her. I don't know, man. It's it's just it's just a huge Huge mess. And Benioff and Weiss took the easy way out. You know, all of the the difficult writing, the reveal to John, John's reveal to Daenerys. They didn't write any of that. That was Cogman and uh, David Nutter or whoever wrote episode one. You know, they did the difficult human writing. Benny F. Weiss just took shortcuts with their episodes, like complete shortcuts. We talked about that in episode, in episode four, where they don't, they don't show Sansa and Arya hearing about who John is, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just any, any fast track way to get from point A to P, point B, mm-hmm. that's what they're going to do. If it means we don't have to film an extra five minutes or something, it means we don't have to fill an extra five minutes or something. But they have time to make cameos. Friggin' Aaron Rodgers was in this episode, apparently. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't see him. Did you see him? Yeah, as well. I mean, after I knew it was him, yeah. W- which part was he in? He was um, 
kind of in the beginning of the uh, battle at King's Landing. You saw sort of like a King's La- a Lannister soldier run off down an alley away from the normal, the regular troops. Mm-hmm. And then you can just see like go up in flames. Yeah, see stuff like that. These guys are just assholes. You know. All right, so Tyrion's a positive. I thought Varys was a positive for the most part. Um, I, I I can't think of any more positives. Arya, the Arya stuff was actually okay. You know, I'm glad she. Ah, uh, God. No, I thought it was okay this episode. You know, I, I think I think we're just sick of her because of, you know, uh, but again, here here it goes again. You have her come down. This is just for shock value right now. You had her come down to King's Landing. Okay, all that way, which is, you know, as we talked about, it's a two month ride at least, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Realistically. Realistically, yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, they come in. They're all trying to walk in there nice and tough, her and Sandor. You know, they got the, they got the strut going. You know, they go past this one mother daughter combo, which is you. Just know already off the bat, like, we're going to see them again in this episode somehow, some way, some fashion. And then you get to this point, and Sandra's like, get out of here, go home. You know, you're not, you know, you're going to die if you come up there. And then it's like, oh, thank you, Sandor. You mean to tell me after all these years that she wanted to kill Cersei, she's going to stop when she's just, like, thinking half a mile away? Right. And, and, and it, you're right. You're right. Almost like she was scared. Like, she can kill the Night King, but... But now, yeah, now she's scared now. I could kill the Night King, but, you know, I'm scared now. And she was right there. Uh, but I did like the stuff of her, you know, running through the streets of King's Landing. Um, you know, even the- What'd you think of the horse? Uh, I would have liked it a lot more if the rest of the episode made sense, but I, I did, I did kind of like it. I don't know if it means anything... Um, You know, somebody online was saying um, it's an homage to to Shadowfax, uh, but I don't think show us show us the meaning of haste. Yeah, I don't think Benioff and Weiss are are, are that good at, at writing. To you know, um, all right. So let's. I mean, unless you can think of something else, let's go to Danny. Let's just cut right into it now. Yeah, because uh, you know, let's. I guess we could kind of talk about Jon Snow with Danny, you know, and and like I said, my beef with with Jon Snow in this episode is his proximity to this evil that's going on, and mm-hmm. you know, he he did look out of place, but he looked helpless also. But what I'm saying is, for his character, can it be considered that he helped destroy King's Landing? Right, because he's so close to Daenerys, you know he pledged his soldiers to hers. You know he fought her case uh, for her for her cause with his own family, who obviously is not. I mean, it's his family. You know, whoever he is, it's his family. Um, and then being in the streets and his men go and start slaughtering other men who have surrendered, and he didn't do any of that, but he was there. And maybe it does tie into the whole when a Stark goes to King's Landing, it, it's not, you know, nothing good comes of it when a Stark goes south, mm-hmm. right? But I, I just, I fear for his character going into episode six because of what happened in episode five. Do you, do you, do you know what I'm saying? Basically, what I'm saying is, where you've been worried, well, you've been worried that Jon Snow is going to die, and I haven't. Like you were at a ninety something percent, you were ninety something percent sure Jon was going to die this season, and I was like, I was like a ten, you know, maybe less. I, I, I think I'm up to like a seventy right now. Yeah. 
you know, what I find with funny is, you know, he turns, and this is why I think I was going to, you know, jump this into the Danny discussion. Sure. Is, you know, that basically he turns Danny down again. Because he's thinking about the whole aunt and nephew thing. So. Do you think it's all that it, or do you think it's partly that he is listening to Sansa and Arya tell them that they don't trust her. She's not one of us. And he's kind of looking at her in a different way. I mean, obviously he is because it's his aunt, but he's also, listen, there's a lot going on in John's mind, um, you know, and committing to Daenerys in a, in a you know, intimate relationship, I'm sure is difficult for him. Um, but I, I don't think it's just her being his aunt. I think, I think there's a lot more to it. Or maybe not. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm not well, it, it maybe you know, this happened right after the Varys thing, so he could be definitely seeing some sh- you know traits in her that are definitely something he definitely does not agree with. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think he's could be drawing away from her in that regard because you know, I'm not going to burn someone alive just because he knows uh, a, a secret. Yeah, but Pretty the, much, but the thing with her burning him alive, like John had to know that that was what was going to happen. It's just you know what it is. It's just not enough with John because a lot of the things that happened with John around, you know, or you know, directly with John, are things that John was against the entire series. So at least show some some conflict. Like write the conflict. Have a scene with him and Daenerys. But again, it's it's Benny Off and Weiss going for the shock, and that's probably what they were doing. Yeah, she tells John uh He he, he has to die. Well, you know, don't don't kill him, you know. Um I don't know. Uh, it, these are just leaps I'm not willing to make for these guys anymore. You know? She, what, what did she say to him? You know, they, people in Westeros, they love you. They fear me. Mm-hmm. Let it be fear. So, like, you take that into account. If I didn't know anything about what was going to happen or if I was even a book reader... I wouldn't be surprised at what she did because she kind of gave it away right there. Well, I, I, I would be surprised the extent that she did it. She destroyed so many innocent people, and I can buy that she that she gets to that point, but I don't think they developed it enough. Like I, I feel like that was too big of a jump from Miss Sandy losing her head to executing Varys, and then to not just destroying King's Landing. It wasn't like, you know, if the Lannister guards surrendered and then she killed them, right? Or if Cersei surrendered and then she killed Cersei. Like, she destroyed King's Landing. She killed hundreds of thousands of people. Or tens, I guess tens of thousands of people. I'm not sure what the population of King's Landing is, but she destroyed them all. Like, I feel like that's too big of a leap. And I'm not saying that it wasn't foreshadowed, right? They were talking about that or Cersei's, you know, let it be known it's on Cersei and that I tried to, I tried to save these people. Yeah, well, you go back to like season one or season two and I think when we couldn't allude before, the show kind of backed off these type of lines from Danny because they didn't want to give anything away on it. You know, they want the shock value but when she's talking with Jorah, I believe it was Jorah, and she's like, when my dragons are born, we will lay waste to cities. We will burn cities to the ground. Mm-hmm. Like, that was, you know, like, without, a, you know, any bit of yeah. thinking on that, that's what we're going to do. We're going to, you know, destroy people. We're going to destroy cities. So it's definitely in her to do that. Yeah. It's in her inner thinking to do that. <laughs> her advisors over the years have stopped her from doing that. They kept her in check. She yeah. does bring it up. Well, I mean, it's like look, check the balance with her. It's like uh, season was well, season seven with the with the Tarleys, and 
if you remember when she did that, I said that's there's going to be narrative justice for her because that's not something a protagonist does, mm-hmm. you know. And she did it, and I I knew there. I was just saying though there there'd be repercussions for that, and that's why I thought that her character wouldn't live to the end of the series because of of that action. It's like Jamie pushing Bran out the window. Jamie's not going to live. It's like Theon killing those innocent kids. Theon's not going to live. Like no matter what they do to redeem themselves in a story like this, they're not going to live. Mm-hmm. Jamie and Theon are both dead. We're assuming Daenerys is going to get killed in the coming episode. I mean, it, it, she can't do that and be sitting on the Iron Throne. Get away with it, right. They're not going yeah. to okay. put her in prison, you know. Um. I don't know. Yeah, it was. It was there. It was all foreshadowed. It was all, mm-hmm. but just the, the the leaps that they made are, are too illogical. Um, and it was, you know, maybe they meant for it to be gratuitous, but it was a little. It was a little much. It was over the top, and I, you know. Well, it's again. It goes. It's the shock value. Yeah. But um, but even like the dragon fire destroying, like yeah, dragon fire can destroy. You know we know from from Harren Hall like dragons can destroy a castle no matter how well it's built, but they don't destroy it like the way that Drogon was destroying it. It was pretty crazy. It just things like like it was like a Michael Bay movie. Just things just blowing up. <laughs> Special guest director. Michael Bay. <laughs> spe- 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 <laughs> special special effects consultant Michael Bay. <laughs> yeah. Like he made yeah, he just like throw Optimus Prime in there. Like you know, it's just it was crazy. And it was I don't know, may- and maybe part of it was having two huge battles so close together. Right? Because usually we'll get like one per season, if that. Mm-hmm. And here we get two, you know, larger scale than anything they've done before, back to back. And in the first one, we see that there's just incredible amount of plot armor. So we don't have any fear for anybody going into the second one. Sloppy, lazy. You know, if you told me that the season would be as bad as it is, I wouldn't think it would be this bad, right? Like if you said, "No, you're gonna you're gonna hate season eight, I'd be like, "Well, you know, it may be disappointing, but I'm not gonna hate it." Like, right? All they got to do is stick the landing. Like they don't have to come up with the ending. <laughs> and you know, it, it's it's the way that they got. You know, <laughs> yeah, they don't have the yeah, exact. There's <laughs> they don't have to come up with the ending, they, but but it, it appears that they have. Yeah. Their own ending, yeah. you know, or de- or definitely uh, the nonsensical way to get to that landing. I mean, obviously, they're coming on a different approach than what the book's going to be, mm-hmm. but they're they're coming in just from like a completely different uh, stratosphere. And what what rules are there that they have to do George's ending? Right, we know that Arya is not going to kill the Night King. There is no Night King, so that battle, if it happens at all, it's not going to end that way. Like it basically, anything from season seven, season eight, I, I, I can't see that being based off anything George Martin writes. So when they had this meeting, it was you know, can you can you tell us what what happens in, in broad strokes in case we you know in case we catch up to. To where you are in the books, yeah. so George- just in case, and uh, that very unlikelihood that we are going to surpass you, right? So George is probably like, "Well, Daenerys is actually going to end up um, becoming like her father, you know, and 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 she's going to destroy King's Landing, um, you know, and, and Arya or John or whoever is going to have to going to have to kill her, you know, and and uh, and Jamie." Is going to 
leave Cersei well, like, and eventually Sean, get back to him. Right. Sean's gonna be, Sean, he's going to be like, wait, well, what season are you up to right by right now? Okay, so he's going to do about 10 more face turns and heel turns. Right, yeah. By the time you get, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he won't in those in those books. Like, you know, Jamie probably is the biggest uh, victim of Benioff and Weiss's storytelling and the way they've moved the narrative around, getting to Dorne. You do that with Jamie. Okay. And then he goes back and then he goes to the Riverlands and then he goes back and then he goes to the North and then he comes back and it gets, it's a little, it's a little, yeah, much. quite a workout. Yeah. <coughs> you know, he travels all these places with no problem until the end when he gets caught off screen. He gets caught by. Yeah. They, we didn't even talk about that. We didn't even talk about why that's once before you really get to the day. So it's, you know, the Tyrion Jamie sequence. That was actually, that was a, it was a real good scene. Um, yeah, it was a very good scene. It was very good. Um, but, I mean, did you catch why? I mean, he gets caught, but why would they catch Jamie? Would, would they have any reason to catch him? I think they said that he was, we, we caught him trying to sneak past, uh, sneak past our lines. Right? Like, sneak past the front line. Okay. Um, And it's like, all right. It's like, all right, all right. So we caught him, but like, what was Cersei? Uh, Cersei. What was Danny going to do with him? Right. So if you catch catch Jamie, like the only logical thing is use him for a hostage. Like you just have him chained up. Like what? What him, him being in King's Landing? What difference is that going to make? You know, if he wanted to do damage, he would have snuck down, and he would have. Tried to kill Danny, or tried to kill John, or tried to kill, you know. Something. Make some sort of, you know, create some right. sort of havoc. And why did he go down in the first, and this goes back to last episode, why didn't he go down with them in the first place? Um, and then why does he go down when, when Regal gets killed? Like, if anything, that that's that's good for Cersei, but he takes it as oh my now now she's gonna kill now she's gonna kill Cersei, so I have to get down there. Yeah, like she's probably gonna kill, kill Cersei anyway. Like you knew that when you left Cersei, like when Cersei made the decision that she wasn't gonna honor the promise she made, you knew there had to be a chance that if you know very like, that they'd be coming for Cersei. Right. It was very likely that if you defeated the White Walkers, which as it turns out, no problem. If you won that battle, Cersei was doomed. You knew that. You had to have known that. And he, he seemed at peace with that when he left. And, you know, you want to sell me, well, he, want, he wanted, you know, at the end, he, he wanted to be by her side when she died. Yeah, I, I can buy that because they loved each other. But the decisions that Cersei made this season and the way she's portrayed, which is completely as a villain. Right, she, other seasons she's a villain, but other seasons she's written in that shade of gray. She's written with human elements that mm-hmm. that, that make mm-hmm. you kind of care about her, but not this season. This season she's just written, it, you know, she may as well have been. She, she should have just been twirling a mustache with the decisions she made. You know, any sympathy you felt for Cersei this season that was all Lena Headey. That's not the way Cersei's written. But again, it's just it's just illogical. Illogical. So I don't know. Go, you know, going back to Danny's is it, just it's just too big of a. I could live with it. I could live with it well, better if I, other things well, made, yeah. if other things made more sense. I could I could live with it better. But it I do think it's just too big of a leap, um, to go from. Like I said, losing Jorah, losing Miss Sandy and her dragon to destroying everybody that lives at King's Landing. Listen, that a lot of people have lost in this story, have lost family members, they've lost friends, but they don't go around killing innocent people for it. No. And that was the biggest wholesale slaughter 
in this series, is what Danny Yeah, said. I mean, and maybe you could say, well, they don't have, like, a, basically a nuclear weapon by their side, how, like, a dragon is. Mm-hmm. But still, that doesn't, yeah, they still don't go around killing anyone. Right. You know, I mean, you know, what I really want to say, and it's just something I've been seeing all week on YouTube, seeing all week, you know, on the reviews and the comments from everyone, I'm just so sick and tired of the excuses they give for Danny for doing this. You know, the, um, you know, the reasoning, yeah, they, 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 to try to, um, like justifying it, justify it. And, 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 and when I say justify, like, you know, not that they justify what she did, but to kind of justify why she did it, you know, it's John's fault. It's Sansa's fault. It's uh, Cersei's fault. It's it's all the people who died around her. You know that 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 drove her crazy. That that was the final that was the final blow. Mm-hmm. And you know she isn't psycho. She's not mad like her father, but she had a tipping point and a boiling point. And she had you know and listen, you know all those people that she killed. There was lines of shoulders in there. So it was a strategic, you know. Come I've on. heard everything. This is strategic. Yeah, someone said that. Someone said, like, you know, well, you know, there were some lads of soldiers in there with those innocent people. So, you know, you know, it, war's war and innocent people die in war. I mean, dude, like, obviously they were running for their lives or just caught up to regular civilians. Yeah. They weren't there because they, they were stationed there. Right? You know, this is on her. And for the people who... You know, before I get on to the whole entire Mad Queen thing, for the people who want to blame John because John told Sansa and all that, and that kind of guy, listen, I said it after season, after episode two of the season, that Danny's the biggest hypocrite there is. Well, she's all her life. Yeah, she's she's detached. She's not. She never loved John. Mm-hmm. You know, for her, it was all about getting the Iron Throne, and I get that, right? You know, but for people to be not, I mean, you can't justify the action of what she did, but justify her mindset and and understand her mindset. Like, yeah, but the whole point is, and here's and here's the whole point. And and and, and I know you want to, but here's here's the point of George's story: is the atrocities of war. You know, the effects of war. War, war is bad, and the dragons have been compared by him in interviews as being the equivalent of, of, of nuclear weapons. So if war is bad, then nuclear weapons are worse. And the Targaryens and the dragons, the idea is that they, their existence has caused this world to not develop at all. It's been around for thousands and thousands of years, and they're still in a medieval feudal type system, a monarchy, and there's no technological development. There's no, there's no nothing. Like they're they're just in this perpetual state of swords and lords and and small folk and uh, you know a, a ruling oppressive class. Um, and the death of, of small folk fighting for their lords for reasons they don't know. And you have these seasons which are totally out of whack, right? Winters last for years, summers last for years. Mm-hmm. It everything is out of whack. It's like it's it's a world that like we can comprehend because the characters are human, but it's also a world that like is is alien because it's it, there's never any advancement whatsoever. You know, the, techn- the technology they had at the beginning of the Song of Ice and Fire is the same that they had, you know, 10,000 years before that. And the reason for that is the dragons. The dragons are what's keeping, you know, this society um, and maybe, all, you know, all societies. And maybe it's not just dragons. Maybe it's dragons and, it, and it's magic. But these, you know, these typical these these fantasy tropes, which George puts on 
such a big pedestal, rightly so, they're not good for the people of the known world, the people of Westeros. They're preventing them from growing and, and you know, it's like the, uh, what was it, the Old Town Conspiracy or the, Mace, the Grand Maester Conspiracy? The Gr- Maesters are against the Targaryens and against the dragons. Mm-hmm. And it, it makes sense because they're men that study and learn and, you know, they study the stars and numbers and, you know, biology in, in a crude form, but they never make any headway, you know? So my point being is the conclusion that Danny and her dragons or Danny and her dragon in this case are bad guys you don't see it because George gives us the human side of it. Benioff and Weiss gave us the human side of Daenerys Targaryen, but her sitting on the Iron Throne with a dragon, that's the last ending that we'd get. That's that's the opposite of what George is trying to get across in his story. And it's easier to see now. You know, like I, I didn't say this a couple of years ago, but the idea that, you know, dragons – are preventing the world from evolving. You know, that's been an idea that's out there. And the idea of Danny becoming like, becoming the Mad Queen, becoming like her father, that, that idea has been out there. And it, 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 it all makes sense now. So, yeah, I mean, you know, these people that are justifying her mindset, like whatever, it doesn't matter. That's, that's not the point. The point's not why she, she did it. Like she's, I mean, I guess the point is why she did it, but, it shouldn't be a surprise that this is where her character has gone to. Like it's not, it's not a, her parent, her parents were brother and sister, right? The incest, the dragons, you know, she, she's Valyrian. She's not even from Westeros. Of course, she's not going to be sitting the Iron Throne at the end. But, but I want um, with her being a hypocrite is you know I she always wanted to meet family and be with family. She's like, oh, she's the last Targaryen, blah blah blah. Now she finally meets a Targaryen, but as soon as she meets a Targaryen that has a higher claim than she does, like right away it's like, oh my god, you don't you know the, the you know you can't you can't take you you can't take the, you know the throne. It's my throne. Right. Like she's so hungry for power. Right. And like no one realized that she's kind of she's already had those like tyranny type thoughts in her head that she just wanted this power. Yeah. Instead of being like, you know what, let's talk about this. Maybe we should get married. You know, you have the higher airship. Maybe we, you know, maybe that's what we should do, you know. But no, right away it's you know, tell your brother and your best friend, don't say anything. No one can know about this. Yeah, that should have been explored more. Like, all these things, they could have worked if they had a few extra scenes revolving around mm-hmm. it. But, uh, you know, the, the idea of, of, you know, her looking for family and she finds out that John is his family, you know, is her nephew and he has a better claim. Like, yeah, the Targaryens, I mean, throughout history, the Targaryens, too many Targaryens is a big problem. Too few Targaryens is a big problem. You need just the right amount of Targaryens because – if there's too many, they're going to compete with each other for power. But if there's too few, well, then you worry that there's no air, you know, and that can cause problems. Mm-hmm. And the, that idea of the Targaryens as above <laughs> Westerosians, right? Like they're, they're, they keep the bloodlines pure. Um, you know, that's, that's an evil sounding characteristic of, of this house, but it's also really interesting. And I, I think the things that Danny did, I think it embodies that because I don't think she really loved Jon Snow. She's just, she was using that relationship because she knew she could trust Jon Snow and she knew there was something about Jon Snow in, in battle or something about Jon Snow and the way that 
you know, men would follow him that would be useful to her. So, it, you know, she may have come across to John like she loved him, but she didn't like truly love him. I don't think that Daenerys Targaryen is, is capable of love. You know, a lot of people, Cal Drogo, you know, I don't like that he's such a popular character for TV people. You know, I hated that cameo in season two because, you know, they put that relationship on a pedestal, Cal Drogo and, and, and Daenerys. Like, she loved him, mm-hmm. but she, she didn't, she didn't love him. You know, he, he, she was sold to him and he raped her and she just figured out how to deal with it. She smothered him. She killed him. You know, that the, the, uh, Miriam Azdur, like she, she brought him, she brought her into close enough to Drogo where it cost Drogo his life. Like she didn't love Drogo. So that relationship being put on a pedestal in Game of Thrones is, you know, what was the line she had? Uh, I think it was this season uh, about Jon Snow. I think she told Sansa he's one of, only two men that I've ever <laughs> trusted. Yeah. And, you know, alluding to Drogo was the other one. Like, come on. You know, Drogo was a, 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 a pawn in all of this. Um, I don't think that she's capable of love in much the same way that Viserys wasn't capable of love. Like, they're, they're, they're children of incest. You know, that they're <laughs> sociopaths. You identify with Daenerys. She's she's been through a lot of adversity. You know, she's been she's hit bottom and she's risen from that, but at no point has she done that with any sort of true romantic or intimate feelings toward another person. And that's including um what's his face? Uh that she left in charge of of uh, Dario, yeah, including Dario, like that was that was just a a you know she she was using him for pleasure, but also because he was the leader of of the uh, Storm Crows or whatever the Second Sons, whatever his uh, you know whatever his his group was. Um, mm-hmm. So. With with John, she's not in love with him. She's using him. And then when she finds out that he's a Targaryen, then she gets into a, a defensive mode. Because then he's not her loyal subject, the Warden of the North. Then he's got a better claim. So she like, she like amps up. how much she loves him. She amps up, you know, I, I just want to be with you. Like, it's not the case. Like she, she's not capable of those feelings. She's telling John that to try and keep control of the situation. Um, and my point being is that's, that's a Targaryen trait. Like they're playing, they, they play off each other, uh, especially when there's too few Targaryens. And that's been the case through history. So I think it was accurate, but, it wasn't explored enough. It wasn't written well. You know, I mean, basically, most everything that happens this season is, it would make sense if it was written better. If they took more time yeah. to write everything out, everything would just been so rushed. And I think that's really where all this stems from. Look, why don't you Get rid of your stupid subplots in season seven. Your your Peter Baelish, your um I mean, I don't know what else was stupid about season seven. Get rid of the Peter Baelish subplot, right? Because that just took up too much time. Add a couple extra episodes, right? If this was the way you were gonna go with the White Walkers, have that be at the end of season seven then. Have two episodes at the end of season seven, the battle, the long night. You know, maybe Winterfell falls, they make their final stand, you know, at the neck or whatever. And then have season seven end. 
with whatever happens with the with the Night King. Uh, you know, Arya kills him, whatever. And then you can have six episodes devoted to your wheelhouse, which is the politics. And then you can explore these things that are just being literally just being crammed into the last two episodes. But no, they wanted to, you know, they wanted to, they wanted to circle the runway in season seven. They, that's the thing. They don't know what they, they didn't, they didn't have a plan. They didn't know what they wanted to do. They knew where they needed to get to. And it's just like, well, you know, we've been okay so far. Just write whatever. So you said uh, you said you didn't like the name of the episode, huh? No. Yeah, I, yeah, I get it. The bells, the bells went off. That kind of was a ticking point for Danny. Um, Is there anything to that though? Like I, I know the idea of the bells. Yeah, like I don't know why like, the bells and the city surrendered. Right, the, the bell is, the, is is something with dragons. They can't take the sounds of bells or something. The only thing I could think of is, um, the bells and wasn't there something with the bells and Drogo have bells in his hair or something? Yeah, I don't know. That, that, I don't know. But I'm okay. I mean, I'm, I'm I mean, okay with the end with the name just because of you know, what it was to that episode. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I just, I just go, you know, when she, she's killing all these innocent people. I just, I'm so, again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to reiterate how sick I am of the people trying to defend her. Like, you know, it wasn't her fault. If Tywin would, Tywin would have done the same thing. Stannis would have done the same thing. No. Just stop. I just like just admit that you know you're, you know, just admit that this female character that everyone's loved is a psychopath. It's okay. It's, She's a psychopath. It's okay, and it's fairly obvious. face reality. Um, yeah, no, t- uh, Tywin Lannister would be rolling over in his grave uh, with the uh, with all the armies involved in Episode Three and Episode Five. All right, so let's talk red herrings real quick, unless you got something else to say about Daenerys. Um, outside the fact that um, she's just like her father, and every time, what's what's the old saying, Sean? Every time, every time a Targaryen, every time Targaryen's a, born, yeah, every time a Targaryen the is born, the gods flip a coin. Well, we just have to hope for the other side of the coin to take care of her next week. Mm-hmm. So let's uh, let's talk red herrings for a minute. So I'll say a plot element to you, John, and you tell me if it was a red herring or if in episode six it will bear fruition. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Valyrian steel swords. Red Herring. Well, I mean, they do kill the White Walkers, but they definitely didn't use, HBO didn't use the, the, the source to their advantage. They didn't show anything really anything special, one-on-one battles, as we talked about in Episode 3. So, it's kind of like in the middle. Yeah. I mean, they could have just been regular swords, you know, as long yeah. as they had the cat's paw dagger. Okay. Here's one. The romance between Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark. Well, on the show? Yeah. Kind of appears like it's a red herring, but it's a lot more important than the books. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jon Snow being Aegon Targaryen. Let's see what happens in episode six. Well, okay. So what can happen in episode six where you think that would... And I'm not just saying him being Aegon the Tar- Targaryen, the entire the entirety of it. Um, Bran and Sam, Bran saying, "Yo, he has to know who he is. It's important." Um, In that aspect, it's the red herrings right now because it's just what they did to his, what they did for Episode Three. 
made no sense that, like, you know, these people who could have known and should have known it who are, like, Jamie didn't know about it. And people who were in power didn't know about it, really. Um, but I, I still say wait until episode six. I don't really go much into it because it might be a spoiler. I don't want to give it away. But maybe he's now he might have to finally take the mantle of let the man let me be Aegon. He might have to take the torch of me being Aegon Targaryen. Kill the boy, let the man be born. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know if Benioff and Weiss are gonna. <laughs> I don't trust him. Um, okay, so well, how about Bran Stark? Do you think he he saw? Well, let's talk about Bran Stark. I mean, he obviously saw the dragon in his visions. He didn't do nothing. He didn't warn anyone. Like, listen, John, you can't go down south. It's going to be a massacre. They don't explain it in the show. No. But in that interview, I had like, you a, a, an interview with Isaac Hempstead Wright, and the way he understands Bran's power um, and the way it was also explained to him, he can go and see the past – you know, and, and his mission is to know everything about Westeros, uh, about the known world, which he's capable of doing through the weirwood trees. And it's, he can't exactly see the future, but when something comes along, he knows that, you know, he knows whether it's an important piece or not. So, for example, when uh, Peter Baelish gave him the cat's paw dra- uh, dagger, and then he gave it to Arya, not because he knew what she would do with it, but she he knew that she needed to have it for whatever reason. So it's not that he can see the future. He can definitely see, you know, what has happened at King's Landing. Um, to point being, when he, he says that John needs to know who he is now, do you think that was a red herring, or do you think that has to do with what happened in episode five and what will happen in episode six. He might be just a little bit off on time. We thought maybe it was important for episode three. He needs to know now, but maybe he needs to know now for episode six. Mm-hmm. Right. That this is the moment he needs to really understand what he, who he is. Mm-hmm. Now, do you trust Benioff and Weiss to <laughs> kind of salvage this season? And, uh, no, no. <laughs> Anything they do that could be looked upon as positive will be done so quick. You're like, yeah, there you go again. Although for this episode, there's not there's not that many characters that they need to worry about, right? No, not really. You got John, you got Danny, you got Grey Worm, Arya, Sam. Davos, we, Bran, I, Sansa. I'm not going to be surprised if we don't see Sam again. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see Sansa again and we don't see Bran again, but... Oh, you're definitely seeing Sansa. You have to. Yeah. Definitely seeing Sansa again. Like, are they going to... We're going to have another episode where they just travel down to, to King's Landing real quick? It's possible. It's out of control, bro. Out of control. I don't know. What else you got, man? I guess that Art Stark was wrong all those years ago. Robert Brathy was right. Killed a bitch. Yeah. Yeah, right? I, I think I saw a meme or something like that, but... Yeah, I see, I've seen a couple, like, you know... that's <laughs> We owe this guy an apology. <laughs> they're they're, they're going to do another twist where... You know, Robert, Robert's uh, rebellion is fought on a lie. But Robert was right the whole time. You know. Um, How about Braun? What do you, you think Braun's going to show up? In the- yeah, well, yeah, you're definitely going to see him again. Definitely. For, yeah, what, there's only- for what purpose? He's got to get a castle, I guess, right? He's got to get a castle. From Tyrion. Yeah, but he, he felt like such a such a... Heal. He's gonna get the, you know you know who he's gonna you know who you know he's gonna get you know who he's gonna get what he's gonna get the twins because remember remember Tyrion said I'll give you two castles whatever castle I'll double it well 
listen, you know, if you or I was writing it, that'd be uh, that'd be good. But I don't, I, I don't trust him. I don't trust them. And could we talk for a second about <laughs> where they filmed uh, Miss Sandy being beheaded and then the Golden Company making their first and last stand? Mm-hmm. Where, like, where is that exactly? I don't know. That's like, it, it almost seems like that's like. It's, it's got to be the same set as Korth from season two. But like, it, it's just it, that's the illogic in what they're writing. Like that's the set is not; it's not anywhere. That's not. Hmm. Their model for King's Landing for however many years. That's not a place that can be anywhere on that King's Landing. It's crazy, dude. It's crazy. Like, I think... Did it almost look like that's like the entrance where Ned showed up in season one? Or no? No, because they used the King's Road in season one. So, the, you know, the King's Road it ends at King's Landing. Um... It, it looks like it almost looks like they're like at a beach almost you know it's like yeah this is the club <laughs> resort uh, spot for King's Landing it looks a little bit like almost like the Jersey Shore you know like it, you have all that you know shitty New Jersey shrubbery and then shitty yeah. sand and then a dirty beach some dunes mixed in there <laughs> dunes in the shore. Um, I mean I guess it's probably just like the Dragonstone entrance yeah I don't know I don't know, dude. They needed more. Like, all of this could have been better with more. And I don't understand why they didn't do more, except laziness. Like I said, they had Mm -hmm. no other projects going on. And you know what? Kathleen Kennedy and uh, Lucasfilm, Disney, like, they they deserve it. You reap what you sow. You sure do. You know, you, you assume something will be good just because of what it is. And that's what Kathleen Kennedy and Lucasfilm, well, uh, Disney owned Lucasfilm have been doing from the beginning with Star Wars. And, uh, you know, nobody embodies that attitude better than Benioff and Weiss who have just mailed in this last season um, on the assumption that, well, this Game of Thrones, you know, as long as we do some shocking deaths, it'll mm-hmm. be fine. Okay, final question, John. Is there any way they can turn it around with one episode remaining? Or is it too far gone? From a overall viewpoint of what this season has been or a personal viewpoint? Both, one at a time. Uh, short answer for overview, probably not. I think it's too far gone right now with the pacing, the poor writing. Um, uh, you know, maybe in this next episode there might be some more exciting points. Uh, personally, um, it's not going to happen. But uh, you know, I, I just uh, John taking the throne, but it's not going to happen. So. I think I'm in agreement with you. Um, if they can somehow parlay what Daenerys has done into a threat greater than the White Walkers, right? So John's what Bran thought John would be for the White Walkers, he's actually that with Daenerys, then maybe it will make more sense, but I think that the writing has been so bad. The leaps have been so big. The canon has been ignored and the logic is just not there that it's, they messed up the landing and uh, 
it's possible they don't crash and burn, but this is definitely a crash landing. Definitely a crash landing. Okay, one more question. Of all the characters that are no longer with us in Game of Thrones, who do you feel has gotten the worst treatment in terms of their writing and character arc and demise? Uh, I guess you could probably put Jamie up there. <clears throat> yeah, I think I might go with Jamie. Although might have to put I'm, 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 might have put Stannis. Yeah, yeah, but Stannis, like you know, or how about this? They didn't try to make Stannis what he was in the books. I don't think. What about the Night's King? That's a good one. That's a good one. I mean, eight years, and, he, and it's like huh, that's it. <laughs> yeah, well, eight years, but like he also supposedly had hundreds of years to prepare for <laughs> what he was doing. Yeah. Could have got some better armor or something. I knew I should have covered that one spot. Yeah. Should have doubled up. Um, I'm very worried about John and his character going to episode six. Very, very worried about it, John. I don't want to make you nervous, but I don't think at this point, you know, you've prepared yourself for the worst. We've seen the worst. Uh, and I'm very worried for what they might and could very well do to Jon Snow. That they haven't done already by killing his character, pretty much? Well, I don't think they... Killing his arc? Yeah, I don't... I, 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 it really depends what happens with him in this last episode. Um, shit, man. I, I just... I just remember the Battle of the Bastards and the Winds of Winter. Those are the high points of the of the series. That was likely mm-hmm. the culmination. Um, and I saw a meme saying when Game of Thrones really ended, and it had a picture of uh, the Night King, you know, blowing up the wall. But I think Game of Thrones, as we knew it, the show that we loved, I think it ended with the end of season six uh, because season eight does a lot of damage to season seven. And uh, we went very easy on them in season seven. Mm -hmm. Game of Thrones, the show that we knew and loved, that ended with the Winds of Winter episode. Anyway, you got anything else, my man? I am sure we're missing stuff, but I, I yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess we can we can talk all day about the massacre. I guess, but it's kicking a dead horse at this point. Listen, yeah, she's the Mad Queen, the villain. All you kiddies out there, named Khaleesi. Hopefully, they become sociopaths. Otherwise, the name just won't fit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if you're <laughs> uh, unbelievable, bro. Yeah, re- real quick. You know, it's almost as if this turn of uh, of Danny is almost sh- similar to Anakin's killing of the uh, Sand People. I think it's more like his killing of the younglings. Yeah, well, I mean, maybe everything combined. Yeah. Where then, you know, it's like he just tries to look for anything to justify what he did. Mm-hmm. You know, I did it for my own republic. <sighs> but e- even if that's unbelievable, at least we know with Anakin that he becomes Darth Vader. Like he, you know, he 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 becomes the antagonist. You know, he goes from the protagonist to the antagonist. And we know that that's his fate. With Daenerys, it's like... Well, I mean, maybe it is the same thing. I, I don't know. But I just feel like... Well, it's not because we, the audience knew that with Anakin. Everybody knew he'd be Darth Vader yeah. with Daenerys. Yeah, I think they were trying... 
they they made such big leaps because they were trying to hold it off for it to be a surprise, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, which was I understand why they wanted to do it that way, but it was uh, you know they don't have the uh, technical or detail oriented expertise to do something like that, and uh, it just it doesn't work. It does more damage to the credibility of the storytelling of the story itself than it does give us a surprise to go, oh my god, I can't believe Danny did that. Uh, whatever, man. They're jackasses. Danny Alpha Weiss. They're the worst. They're really the worst. They wrote, you know, they wrote X-Men Origins Wolverine, right? Yeah. Like that like they like Deadpool in that movie. You know, compared to how much money Deadpool makes now, we should have we should have known from that adaptation uh, what they'd do with this adaptation. There's this guy on YouTube. I forgot his name, but he's uh he just rips them, just rips them. I'm David Benny. I'm David. I did X Men Two, Wolverine. You know, whatever. You know, Origins and. Another whatever the movie did, bang off, and I want you a complete and complete jackass. <laughs> there's that, um, and there's nothing on YouTube. It's so funny how you went behind the episodes. This you know about after this episode four, you know when Benny off is like saying, you know, and Danny she 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 forgot she forgot completely forgot about the Iron Fleet. But like meanwhile, like a half hour earlier, right. you know, Varius says the Iron Fleet is with Euron. Like you, mm-hmm. Cer- how do you? Cersei think- knows we're coming. Like Danny says that. Yeah. <coughs> and again, there's ways to make that work, but they just don't. It, they, it's like they didn't want to take the time. It's probably all first draft scripts that they tossed in. Yeah, there wasn't really even any dialogue in in the last episode. Not really. You know, maybe maybe twenty pages, and then it's just all a, a really long battle. Yeah, whatever, dude. I'm not. This is what it is. This is what it is. I do hope George gets this book out just to kind of cleanse the palate of what these fuckers have done, and, mm-hmm. and hopefully, you know, maybe we'll get a reboot in our lifetime. When we're 70. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Benny Off and Weiss's sons <laughs> get together. Well, uh, yeah. Real real quick. What was what was that embarrassed in some of these actors saying all that stuff? I don't know, man. Is he just so bitter? I mean, there's got to be something there. There's got to be something there. Because, like, why would he just make that up? I, mean, I don't know. It was a comic kind of Russia, so maybe he thought, like... You know, I'll say something, they'll translate it. Yeah, no one no. Yeah, yeah, whatever, they're just Russians, they don't care anyway. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. There's got to be something there, though, because... No, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, George was pretty... Uh, the next day, came out the next day. <laughs> don't you guys know I'm not even halfway done writing Winston Winter yet? Jesus Christ. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't think he's done with. I just restarted writing. I don't think I don't think he's done with both books, and you know, gun to my head, I doubt he's done with the Winds of Winter. But it wouldn't surprise me if, kind of like you were saying, we get an announcement when the season's over. It wouldn't surprise me that, you know, when it was obvious the show was going to end before Winds of Winter came out, or you know, Winds of Winter would come out like just before the last season airs. It wouldn't surprise me if there was a decision, you know, just at this point, just hold off. Um, and what, first off, yeah, I don't think, I don't think the guy would just make that up. That's, it's like trolling people. I don't, I don't think he would do that. I also don't think he's privy to information that nobody else is privy to. Um, but what makes me, think maybe there's something to it is that before Roy Dotrice died, um, he said something to the effect of, I have to go into the studio soon, you know, to, right. to record the, 
audio version of The Winds of Winter. And then he died. I don't know if he started recording it or, you know, if the book was almost finished. I mean, he's got a, you know, that, that would be done before the book is actually published because it generally comes out at the same time, the audio version of a book like that, at least. Um, so maybe there's something to it. Maybe the Winds of Winter is finished and, uh, you know, and he was just waiting for, Season eight to end, and um, I hope, but I'm not going to be surprised if it's not. And uh, whatever it is, you know, we, you and I have to find something else to enjoy. I guess <laughs> I, I don't know. We'll do a Battlestar Galactica rewatch. Hmm. Anyway, thanks for listening. You can find us facebook.com slash the Promised Princes. We're on Twitter at Princes Promised, and uh, I keep meaning to post some more. <laughs> Of these great memes, if anything, you know, the, the, the big positive out of season eight has been just some real unbelievable memes. Memes. Yeah. And not, Love not the just memes. brand memes. Like, it's like been a resurgence in uh, Jorah Mormont memes and um, just everybody's got memes now. It, it's great. And the Westeros Companion, Princes That Were Promised.com. Find our podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube. Thank you for listening. Good luck to you with episode six, which we're both agreeing it's going to be called the dream, uh, a dream of spring. Most likely. I would have to imagine. Yeah, but what do we know? Either way, we'll talk with you guys next week. Bum, 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 bum,